Hey guys, so Cal Val here. You are listening to the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast. Welcome everybody back to the Hit in the Turnbuckle podcast. I am your host Adam Cousins. It is Monday evening here, but I am joined by my good friend stateside, my AEW maestro, Mr. Parker Hamlet. How are you? Honestly, man, I'm I'm really happy to be here with you. You always give it honest down the middle. A lot like me, Adam, you're a consumer of all types of wrestling. And we were heading into a polarizing pay-per-view last night for all the wrestling being live from the united center in chicago illinois home of one phil brooks aka cm punk who of course was terminated from AEW. pretty much what the day of the show we dropped our emergency pod yep. and uh you know obviously there's a lot of people that are happy about it there's a lot of people that are upset about it but all in all as, as a cm punk you know die hard i i don't think AEW could have done any better then they really did last night, and I was going in to the pay-per-view being kind of pessimistic, so kind of excited to talk this one, and, uh, you know, let's just get into it. Yeah, I'm going to start with my sort of overall thing of AEW, of this particular show, because it was it felt like a lot of the shows, a lot of the premium live events or pay-per-views this weekend, very, very, uh, a lot of people were very uninterested, they wasn't expecting a lot to happen. Although AEW is still in its infancy, what I took away from this was I felt that this was like a, not necessarily a changing of a guard, but a starting of a new era. We saw a lot of the younger talent, not necessarily win their matches, but get elevated by the bigger talent there. And I don't know if that's something that you agree with, Parker, but that's what I've taken away from a very stellar pay-per-view from AEW. I mean, I definitely couldn't agree more with you, Adam. I mean, obviously... You know, you had some last minute changes because of Phil Brooks' exodus from all elite mm-hmm. wrestling, being Brian Danielson stepping in, taking on Ricky Starks rather than CM Punk for the Real World's Championship, which we can only assume has been retired now. And mm-hmm. with that being said, I'm a big advocate for just because you beat somebody doesn't make you the man. I mean, look back at WrestleMania and the build up for that. Austin Theory and John Cena were feuding. And, you know, Cena had a great point in his promo build up with theory he basically stated that you know hey you can beat me but you're still going to be a nobody come monday and i think everybody who was in a position to be elevated on the show was elevated there was one decision in particular i wasn't quite and i you and i haven't discussed yet but i'm pretty sure you know where i'm going with this but i'll save that for once we get to that but i, I definitely agree with you this was a change obviously you have a lot of really well tenured veterans in AEW who are you know I, I hate to use this word, but pillars of, of kind of what they've been building. You know, you look at the last fallout with with Punk after Brawl, at last, you know, kind of a year to the day now, actually today, a year to the day. Yeah. And who stepped in and, and kind of made things work? It was John Moxley and Brian Danielson. So, obviously, you know, very similar situation here. Deja vu, especially for Brian Danielson, who has filled in for Punk before and a company he's left in, in WWE. So, I thought for the hand that they were dealt, they honestly couldn't have done any better. And like you said, they elevated a lot of young names. Obviously, I, I still have some reservations about the pay-per-view in general. But overall, I can definitely say this over-delivered, Adam. And, you know, it's funny because you had a lot of AEW talent go on social media today, one of them being Anthony Bowens, and kind of state that, you know, they don't really care about the outside noise that comes along with what people think about these build-ups for these pay-per-views because they're going out and over-delivering. Tony Khan even said he's not really paying much attention to the discourse anymore. I'm not a big fan of that. They, they honestly were well-deserving of all the adversity they were facing going into the show. But, you know, before we get into it, I definitely will say, you know, they over-delivered, and that's coming from a CM Punk fan. Exactly that. So let's get into it. This started with the uh, – they had the pre-show. We, we won't get it. We'll just go straight main card. Um Better than you, Bay Bay, uh, against the Dark Order. Dark Order won the Battle Royal. They do a lot of Battle Royals on Rampage. I've seen quite a few of them recently. Uh, Dark Order and Better Than You, Bay Bay, uh, kicked off the show. It's actually really quite a fun tag, a really fun opener. I think they started it hot with Adam Cole and MJF. They love these guys, the crowd at the minute. They love the chemistry they've got going together. I think it's absolutely priceless. We know something's coming in the future, but right now we've got to enjoy this role. The kangaroo kick, the double clothesline. But the interesting bit, Parker, come up at the end of this match, because as Adam Cohen and especially MJF are walking up the aisle, a certain Samoan monster comes out and decides to pick a fight with MJF. What did you think of the match? And ultimately, the ending of the match kind of sets up 
I suppose, where MJF's going next. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, honestly, this was a, a segment that I was not anticipating, but I was, you know, happily surprised by what transpired after the match. But as for the match itself, like you said, fun opener, better than you, Bebe, being one of the top Mercedes in AEW, just behind Mr. Phil Brooks before his release from All Elite Wrestling. So this is a popular act, and obviously it's still kind of in its, in its infancy. I, I kind of anticipated there would be a little bit of a honeymoon stage between the two after what happened, what transpired at Wembley Stadium, and uh, so far I'm right. But with that being said, you know, there are some moments in this match where there's little subtle storytelling of MJF getting absolutely decimated and Adam Cole not exactly doing all that he can. I mean, Dark Order did the best they could in this situation, and I thought this was a fun opener, utilizing it and getting this crowd nice, nice and spruced up for the evening. And a Samoan named Joe, not the tribal chief either, walks down the ramp, does a nice little Easter egg back to NXT where MJF was an extra. And he got pushed by Joe. I thought that was a really, really nice callback. And I thought MJF storming the ring like the hot baby face was just badass. And I think a lot of people didn't see this coming, but it's something that we're all certainly looking forward to. And I think now, honestly, the Eliminator Tournament's becoming more clear now. I mean, you know, you could say now more than ever, MJF is now on a collision course with one Samoa Joe, who is, of course, the Ring of Honor TV champion. Uh, obviously, no love lost for Joe, and I don't think anybody would be mad if he did eventually dethrone MGF for the title, but I don't see that happening. But I really like them digging in to the storied history between MJF, uh, uh, of course, Samoa Joe, and hell, even Samoa Joe and Adam Cole have some yeah. history dating back to NXT. So there's a lot of stuff they can do with this, and I think it adds a nice wrinkle to the Better Than You Bebe storyline and uh, was a nice surprise to open the pay-per-view. It certainly was. I, I I must admit, I did pop when uh, when he when he put MJF in the chat. I love I love Joe. I'm a big Joe fan. I think he's uh, since Ring of Honor. I, I, well, actually, since he come over here in 03, 03, 04 and I saw him. It was it was amazing. So I've been a Joe fan for that. But it kind of set up the the next match was Samoa Joe. So Shane Taylor and I call this the big old meat slapper. There's a couple of these on the show. Uh, Joe and, and Shane Taylor left this all. I mean, it was literally six, six and a half minutes, but they left this all in the ring. They were dropping each other with some big hits. Ultimately, Joe uh, gets the win with the, the, the with the Coquina clutch. And it just proves that matches don't have to be long to be great as long as they're done in the right way. And they, I think AEW done this absolutely perfectly. I, I don't know what you think about it. It was definitely a precursor of, of course, the meat slapping that you're referring to, because I got a lot of good things about the other big man match, but I kind of was talking about the formula in one of our last pods that, you know, go out there and have a Lesnar Goldberg kind of, you know, under 10 minute, you know, just kind of spam fest and the fans are going to eat it up. And, you know, obviously you want to make Samoa Joe look strong and all the while doing that, you're giving Shane Taylor a great showcase. So obviously ROH fans are, are very familiar with Shane Taylor and him getting any pay-per-view time is something that I'm sure no one is going to be upset about. So for this, this match served its purpose and prolonged the storyline with making Joe look like the most menacing man in all elite wrestling. And I'm not going to lie to you. There were a lot of, I, I, I like to call this apology booking on this show because there was a lot of people that have been affected by the, CM Punk nonsense in AEW. Yeah. And Joe was definitely one of them after the reports we heard coming out of Wembley Stadium. So to kind of propel him to a main event program and give him this great showcase and a hot United Center, I definitely think was a thank you to Joe. And I, I definitely think we're at a point where Joe definitely deserves his flowers, especially after, you know, the absolute malpractice there was of how he was booked in WWE. So more Joe on my TV, the better. Exactly. And mine. I love Joe. I love Joe. Like I said, I don't think I can say it enough without people getting worried so i will say i, I love joe and we'll leave it at that um tnt championship uh next darby and luchasaurus this was the most vicious i have seen luchasaurus i want to see more of that i mean he cut him open early he whipped him into the steps he busted his head open he literally put the steps on top of his back and walked into the ring this was the, the luchasaurus i really want to see the evil side of him um, he had a it was a it was a really good match with Derby. This went about 15 minutes. Derby got a little bit, it felt like a and I don't want to, I don't mean this horribly to Derby, but it felt like a 15 minute squash in a lot of ways. Derby did get a lot of offense in, but this is the Luchasaurus I've been wanting to see, Parker. I don't know how you know he's had the thing with Jungle Boy and they were this dancing to not they dancing tag team, but the crowd loved it. This is the side I want to see as Parker 
Do you do you agree with that? I definitely agree that this was a phenomenal showcase for Luchasaurus because I mean, really, when you think about it, like this, he's kind of been in Christian Cage's shadow, and obviously, Christian Cage is a huge mer merch mover for All Elite Wrestling. I mean, excuse me, a huge character on All Elite Wrestling TV right now, and he's getting over the dead dead gimmick is just absolutely catching fire on all cylinders thank god and you know we find out post show that you know christian of course just signed a big fat contract extension with all elite wrestling so it seems like christian is here to say i really thought this was going to be a coronation for darby allen to kind of elevate the tnt title but in a very short amount of time that christian cage and source have been appearing i feel like they've done a lot of good stuff and they've made the tnt title I, I dare say they've elevated it just about as much as Darby could have, hypothetically, in my opinion. So I thought, like you mentioned, this was an extremely physical contest. There's no way Darby's going to be walking when he's 40 by this point. But, you know, I, I thought this was really physical. I love the crucifix bomb pin uh, during the match. So that was a really cool touch. I mean, Darby got absolutely brutalized. But all in all, I also thought this was a great showcase to just show just how damn good Luchasaurus really is. So... I think this helped out everybody involved. And I, I don't know about you, Adam, but well, I'm going to do a little speculation here. Mm -hmm. Post-match, there mm -hmm. was a angle where there was a concerto that was going to be done to one of the baby faces. And I'm sorry, but as a consumer of both WWE and AEW, I'd be foolish not to mention that the concerto is a very – valuable plot device and one of adam copeland aka edge on wwe programming so it seems like they are already planting the seeds you know you have christian go out and during the post media press program say i don't have any friends except for luchasaurus yes. uh and myself and you know i thought that was great but as soon as i saw that concerto spot i was like man edge is coming it's just a matter of when at this point so 10 out of 10. I loved it. I thought the whole thing was awesome. And what do of a pay-per-view match? It definitely was a pay-per-view match. And I, yes, I did get those Easter eggs. I did watch the post-scrum. The first thing Christian said was, how was everybody's dad? <laughs> which, is, which, uh, yes. everyone, <laughs> which everyone laughed at. He did obviously mention the friends. It is probably about three or four weeks before Edge's actual contract. His talent contract, match contract has already finished with the WWE, but he's actual... Main well, contract. they can kill. They can kill some time. They'll be okay. Exactly, and you, you've done the right thing. We, we've mentioned about the the plotting of the concerto and the Easter. It kind of feels like we're there. And I also think that I don't think the WWE have the rights to Metangulus's song. So no. So Edge has actually gone on record talk. I think it was on mm -hmm. the Impulsive podcast, and he pretty much said that Alter Bridge gave him the rights to that song in the early two thousands. Kind of you know getting it in and getting lucky because I mean that kind of stuff just doesn't fly nowadays and. Obviously, royalties and all that stuff would make it a huge thing. But Edge, a lot like Punk, pretty much owns his theme. So that's definitely – you're going to hear Metalingus. It's just a matter of what he's named in all the wrestling is the thing I'm curious about. But like you said, we're a month out until we find out that kind of stuff. But it was definitely cool to see them kind of let us know subtly that he's coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I enjoyed that. I think wherever it is, maybe after Ash or something, the roof will blow off that place if when shoot well when I think more than if that that happens and I, I can't wait. I'm thinking Grand Slam. Yeah, possibly. Is that Arthur Ash? That Grand. Yeah, Slam? Arthur Ash honestly just makes the most sense in my opinion. You're gonna have the biggest audience before Full Gear. I know they have that uh, that that Seattle live show, but I, I think that's before Edge's contract. Uh, no compete is up, so yeah. I think Arthur Ashe is a is a fitting place, and it's interesting because you know Edge was talking about uh, New York in one of his last big SmackDowns and all the history that's tied to that. So honestly, I think him making a huge debut at a packed Arthur Ashe AEW Grand Slam is probably going to be the big Grand Slam moment outside of the title match that we're probably going to get. So. I, I very much look forward to it. And like usual, AEW kind of subtly lets their viewers know that something's coming. So can't yeah. wait for that on the horizon. And Tony Khan's little smirk during the question when they asked Christian about Edge was uh, telling. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> it's telling as well, even if he didn't confirm anything. Um, I mentioned earlier two big men slapping meat. Uh, uh, and that goes well with the next one, Miro and Hobbs. Christ almighty. These guys were unbelievable. Um, they put on a really good, again, it was a really good but relatively Oh, it's a 15 minute match. It went long enough, but it was a very much a hard, yeah, we saw about hard hitting contest. These guys hit it off. I'm hoping 
this is the start of a feud between these two. Miro hasn't really had a proper feud as such since he's been here. Hobbs has been crying out for this. But at the we'll talk about the end quickly as well. They hugged. All of a sudden, Hobbs starts absolutely battering Miro. And then out of nowhere, here comes Lana or CJ Perry. We don't know what she's going to be called yet. Um, Hot and flexible. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> out, um, hits Hobbs with a chair shot, which he absolutely just laughs at. Uh, and then just walks out. And Miro's got a bit of the ump at this point. But this match, Parker, was another 15 minute beat the living crap out of each other. You know, it's really interesting, right? Because Tony said that he's not really paying much attention to the discourse on what people expect of these matches. And maybe I was a small minority in this, Adam, but me and Dave have, have said on the show countless times that we were concerned that, you know, they were going to have a, 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 a dirty finish here and they weren't going to let these two go at it. And seemingly Tony Khan did not go the route. He's really gone with Powerhouse Hobbs up to this point. So no sighting of Aaron Solo, no sighting of QT Marshall. You just let these two absolute behemoths kick the shit out of each other, Clash of the Titans style. And that's exactly what the fans wanted, and that's exactly what we got. And there really was no loser in this. And I did, I said there wasn't going to be a loser in it if this was the game plan that they followed. And the Chicago crowd absolutely ate it up. I thought it was amazing. Made both men look like complete badasses. You certainly hope that this is not it. But a nice little, you know, not too long contest. And, you know, I, I'm definitely happy about the abundance of direction that we seem to be getting with Miro's character pre, post, all, all, all now just in, on AEW television in general because this is a guy that has just been lost in the shuffle, lost in the gray, and, you know, ever since – his big loss to uh i want to say it was brian danielson at full yeah. gear uh ever odd amount of time ago he hasn't really had much of a sense of direction but ever since legends debut miro has been on tv and now miro seems to have a an a, a slash b storyline with his real life wife cj yeah. perry uh, formerly known as lana and i and me saying hot and flexible was an opinion by the way it was on the jumbotron but yes. i thought it was interesting that she she, I mean, it is my opinion too, but that I digress. So <laughs> anyway, um, when you sit here and look at, you know, the, the post-match angle, I thought it was, it was really funny because you had Miro kind of look at her and, you know, instead of, you know, embracing her and thanking her, he just kind of looked at her and said she wasn't real over and over and over again. So I'm kind of interested to see what angle they take with this, with the Redeemer you know, and all that other stuff, what, what kind of mural lore they're building up. But just another segment where everybody comes out of this a million times better than they were coming in. So just another great match on a really underrated, uh, uh, just a car that no one really expected this from, honestly. So, yeah, I love that. I thought this, I love them top of the matches, especially when they get booked right like this. Um, now we move on. We talked about the women, and this weekend the women have had some um, great matches, and this one was nothing short of great. I wasn't necessarily a big. Well, I like the ending to a degree because it sets up something. But Ruby Soho come out with her old music, Rancid, uh, which was um, obviously Destination Unknown, which was quite interesting because they were she was with Soraya, and they are the Outcast, so it didn't have the Outcast theme, which was kind of telling. Uh, Statlander for me, ever since she's come back from injury, I know she won the title when she come back. I felt as if she was a bit rusty early doors. This match was the best match I've seen Chris Statlander have in, in, in a while. Uh, Ruby Soho is always a good hand to put in the ring with anyway. So a really good back and forth match. It had some good time. It didn't look, it didn't feel rushed even. It, it may have been, but it didn't feel rushed. Uh, this match at all. The end of the match was quite funny and quite telling because Tony Storm, though, Drewby had the spray paint ready to, to do something to Statlander, probably hit her with it or maybe spray her in the eyes of it. She pops up, grabs the, the spray paint from her, and then that allows Statlander to have Saturday, hit Saturday Night Fever and win. Do you think now, going forward, maybe this is the direction Tony Storm wants to go in to try and win that title? Is she next in line for Statlander now? Or is there going to seemingly be a big breakup within the outcast first? And then maybe Tony Storm becomes a face after this. I definitely think that Tony Storm has done remarkable character work. We've talked about that almost yeah. a nauseam here on the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast ever since she's kind of turned to her disgruntled Hollywood character. Kind of reminds me of Scarlett Jr. Hanson and Asteroid City, if I really had to make any parallels. But with that being said, uh, you know, it does seem like Wes Anderson's at the helm of 
this because it's really well constructed, really. I mean, yeah. you look at it from a big picture. I mean, you know, she's scorned, but she's scorned justifiably so because she has been kind of a workhorse. I've always called her the John Moxley of the women's division because she's been an MVP in the ring for all elite wrestling. And yeah. now you pair that with just a phenomenal character. And you've got kind of this faction war going on between the outcasts and the AW originals. I thought it's given us some great in ring stuff. And I and I think that having Tony Storm kind of interfere in this main event is is a good thing for her character in general. I said the faster she gets away from the outcasts, the better. I really feel like, like, you know, Tony really is too good to be in this faction, even though, I mean, obviously they'll hurt a little bit from not having her star power. You still have Soraya. You still have Ruby Soho. You have Mercedes Monet, who is inevitably going to make her debut. So we'll see how she factors into all of this. But, I mean, I, I just can't give yeah, – maybe I'm going to sound like a homer saying this, but I can't give Tony Khan enough credit because I, I say that because, honestly, the women's division in general just felt like it was DOA not even a month ago. Yeah. But – it really feels like when you talk about a soft reset or even a hard reset, the women's division feels like it's really gotten a shot in the arm. And Soraya getting that AEW World Women's World Championship certainly has made things interesting. And it wasn't a popular decision at the time. It still really isn't with a lot of the IWC. But I'm just going to let this thing play out because Tony Storm's doing some of the best work of his career. Soraya is a good women's champion. And and don't even let me get lost on what happened in the ring. I thought Ruby Soho and, and Chris Statlander proved why they're two of the best workers in the women's division. So yeah. I think the AEW women's division is, is sitting pretty nice right now compared to what it was even a month ago. And I thought these two women absolutely killed it. Yeah, they certainly did. And you're right. It certainly feels like it's had a shot in the arm. And perhaps with Mercedes coming in as well, that elevates that women's the women's division even up another level if she, when she finally makes her debut. It's going to be a really exciting time going forward with the prospect of Edge and Mercedes coming in. They are two massive star powers for AEW to elevate their divisions even more so. I can't wait to see that, and I, I'm really looking forward to see how they progress. I'm hoping the women's division stays as strong as it is at the minute. As I say, you look the shot in the arm, as you put it out, has really helped it on this show, and hopefully going forward. I've... <laughs> You know, I've never been a big proponent of the entire, like, fighting champion shtick. Yeah. That's, that's why I compare Tony Storm to John Moxley because, you know, I mean, it works with John Moxley because the dude's a fucking psychopath. But yeah. and I'm not saying Tony Storm isn't an absolute brute in ring. But what I am saying is, is that now that, you know, you're obviously the women get very limited TV time. This is a stigma. This is something that they're kind of working uphill against. And with that being said, you've got to give people compelling storylines, give them something to cheer yeah. for. I feel like if the title was still on Tony Storm's shoulder, people wouldn't care as much. But now we get to see how she is in the chase and an A storyline. And, you know, Soraya is going to play a perfect villain. A lot like kind of what's going on with Trish Stratus and WWE, they are utilizing the star power. And like you said, they've only got more star power coming in. So I'm happy to see how this entire thing plays out. And I thought this was another step in the right direction. Certainly was. Now, we talked earlier on, and I mentioned about how this pay-per-view has elevated people. Uh, and uh, I think the next match, Ricky Starks and Danielson, it, in defeat, he elevated Starks up to the upper echelons level, perhaps where they're trying to get to him. And he's a star anyway. I've liked Ricky Starks. I've been a big fan of Ricky Starks' work. But Jesus, Brian Danielson kicked the living shit out of him. In With this one match. arm. With one arm. He kicked the living crap out of him. Um he ends up passing out uh, to one of the uh, – what was the finishing he passed out to? Oh, it was a strap, wasn't it, around his neck? Yeah, it was a strap around the neck. And I swear Ricky Starks deserved an Academy Award for how he sold it. I mean, it was – I mean, you saw the life leave his eyes. Yeah. It was it was absolutely great selling by Ricky Starks. But, I mean, like you said, I mean, you, you some people will say this is the arrival of Ricky Starks, but I, I think we've already seen why people like Phil Brooks were – probably inevitably going to put him over in Chicago. And that's because this is a guy that needs to make that leap to the, to the main event scene. I've talked in, you know, countless times about how winter's coming last year. He showcased that he can be that main event guy against MJF. And yeah. I thought they had an absolute barn burner. Maybe that's not the trajectory he's on right now, but he is certainly embedding himself in the main event picture. And obviously with CM Punk's, you know, exit from AEW that I've already talked about a thousand times this pod, even though it, it, it's very instrumental because you have guys like Brian Danielson step into the fold and on very short notice, and I definitely say earlier than expected, yeah. gave Ricky Starks, I'd say, a career match. I mean, I, I'm a little bit more of a fan of the winner's coming match, but for everything that this match signified, I mean, this was a tribute to Bray Wyatt, Wyndham Rotunda, yeah. obviously, you know, 
he had Brian Danielson mention their match at the Rumble, and he said, hey, I, last time I had one of these matches, me and one of my best friends beat the shit out of each other. So you know Brian go, comes into this match motivated. And the story, you know, obviously was the strap. And they were just absolutely punishing each other. I thought Ricky Stark showed that no matter who he's in the ring with, he can bring the charisma. He can bring, he he can pretty much be an equal to some of the heaviest hitters in all elite wrestling. So there was a theme throughout the night of the guys not exactly going over, but, you know, looking amazing in defeat. So I thought this served its purpose and it served it well. So I was glad that, you know, Ricky Starks wasn't too affected by Punk's exit and Danielson was able to be a true professional and uh, make a star last night. He certainly did. It was a, I loved that. I, again, I keep saying you would love that match, but I really did. It was a great match. Um, the next match, I, I wasn't a fan of the winners of the next match. I felt as if it should have gone the other way, but maybe maybe there'll be a reason for it and we'll hear about it. It was Eddie Kingston and uh, Shibata versus uh, Castagnoli. And you, you uh, Kingston coming out wearing a Claudio Sucks egg shirt. I think that was a homage to Terry Funk. Terry Funk tribute. Yeah, it certainly was. Uh, he paid homage to Funk with wearing that. This was actually this was actually still a decent contest. Um, but at the end, I was just a bit surprised that Claudio uh, obviously hits the flash KO from a European uppercut and get and actually pin Kingston. I was maybe looking at them two having another feud for the ROH World Title, but it kind of he's already beaten him once and now he's pinned him on this one. So I wasn't quite sure. Where do you think they're going with this going forward, Parker? <clears throat> Well, a, a lot like you, I thought we were getting a lot closer to that clash between Eddie Kingston and Claudio Castanoli. Obviously, those two at one of Ring of Honor's biggest shows had an absolute match of the year candidate. And honestly, it was probably the most invested I was in a match all WrestleMania weekend. And I, my aspirations weren't high going into that contest. But just kind of the tension that Eddie's built with Claudio throughout this point has been palpable. And one of the best things on AEW slash RH programming but, you know, speaking of RH, obviously Claudio Castagnoli is RH World Heavyweight Champion. Yep. So you should expect him to pick up wins and, you know, win meaningless matches. And, you know, with that being said, you know, really think about it. When's the last time you can think that a Blackpool Combat, you know, actually picked up a win on pay-per-view? So I think that's more or less what this was actually about. I still Claudio Castagnoli versus Eddie Kingston is the plan. It's just a matter of when. So, and that, that, man, I really can't wait till that clash happens. And I hope Tony Smart saves it for a big show. Yeah. Cause People I, wanted it last night, but I don't think last night was the right time. Maybe Arthur Ashe, because I think it's time for Kingston to get a title in AEW. I think full gear is perfect. I mean, really, like, I, I think Eddie Kingston's put on great performances at full gear. Historically, you think about him and Punk and, you know, a couple of other of his contests. And I, I think I think full gear needs to be Eddie Kingston's coordination in, in all elite wrestling. And he deserves that big pay-per-view showcase. I mean, even if you pull an audible and, you know, I mean, I, we're probably looking at a situation where it's MJF and Adam Cole in the main event. But I, you can make an argument that due to his popularity, you know, his run in New Japan, that Eddie Kingston deserves a main event of an AEW pay-per-view, even if it is for the ROH world title. He does. He definitely does. And I'm, I'm hoping they put that strap on him because that, that pop's going to be incredible when they put that strap on him. And he's thoroughly deserves it for the work that he does uh, for AEW and obviously for Japan as well. Um, the the next match. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. And, and this is kind of off the dome. Go. If you remember when MJF won the World AEW World Heavyweight Championship, they he actually posted a list of the people that, you know, he would like to defeat during his quote unquote reign of terror. Yeah. Eddie Kingston is on that list, so oh. something something to note and something to keep track of. If if Eddie Kingston, you know, doesn't quite get that big win over Claudio Castagnoli, yeah, he could set his sights on MJF. So never say never. Well, Agent Parker strikes again uh, with with that bit of mem with that bit of memory from MJF's uh, list of terror. I totally forgot about that. So uh, yeah, Agent Parker with another one to keep on now. <laughs> For the future. Um, I'm just a mark, man. <laughs> <laughs> the next match, my goodness me. Um, we're talking about how stars are made. Uh, and we said they didn't have to win matches, but he did on this one. Uh, Takeshita and Omega put on an absolute clinic uh, of a match. Um I, I, can't, I mean, you know, you can put a broomstick. I know you can put a broomstick in the ring of Omega most times out of 10 and, and, and it will be great. But this is absolutely incredible, this match. It had so much going for it. Obviously, there was a bit with the, the screwdriver near the end uh, where Callis had it. He tried to use Omega. He, Omega, he missed. Uh, he 
Takeshita, I forgot, you know, Takeshita had it, uh, and a referee pulled it out of his hands, but he pins Omega one, two, three. We are now witnessing the born or the the new star of AEW in Kanosuke Takeshita. I couldn't. This match was unbelievable, Parker. <clears throat> I'm gonna be honest with you. Yep. It was my expectation for this to be match of the night, and mm-hmm. in my humble opinion, it was match of the night. Yeah, and I say that I say that because obviously there is always going to be that part of the AW fan base and just professional wrestling world that is like, why is Kenny Omega not a singles wrestler in AW right now because of just the quality of matches that he outputs? And this yeah. is another great example of it. Obviously, you know he pinned. Kenny Omega at, at Wembley Stadium, but the way that Callis was selling this, yeah, I knew Takeshita was going to pick up the win. But oh. more than that, I knew, I mean, just following Takeshita, I mean, you had Shinsuke Nakamura actually tweeting about Takeshita last night. Did you catch that? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I thought that was a nice little nod, both of them having big marquee matchups this weekend. But with all that being said, I mean, you know, this is a situation where you need to get on your knees and pray because we apparently now have the next big God of professional wrestling in Kanosuke Takeshita. And, you know, it's interesting because you, can you hear me? Yeah. for loud and clear. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I really think that people kind of sleep on Takeshita and his ability. Mm-hmm. I, I think that, you know, his match he had with MJF on TV was absolutely incredible. It honestly could have been in a fucking pay-per-view, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, I mean, I wasn't surprised by this at all. In fact, I did not start that point all of us like, literally just for this match. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being 100% honest with you. And it over-delivered. You had a, what was it, a blue thunderbomb, avalanche blue thunderbomb off the top. You had them going yeah. for... Avalanche, one wing angels. I mean, you already. Met, I'm just. Oh my god, man! It, it was absolutely crazy. It was almost like a, a video game match. But just the athleticism displayed in this contest is why I love all elite wrestling. It's why Kenny Omega is one of the best professional wrestlers in the world, and it's honestly why AEW was, you know, created was for matches like this and to create stars. So I thought this was a star making performance for Kanosuke Takeshita and. You really couldn't ask for more out of this contest. Definitely my personal match of the night, and uh, bravo to Kenny Omega. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. And to be fair, the next match wasn't exactly bad either. Uh, they followed that up with Bullet Club Gold, uh, the Bang Bang Gang, or whatever you want to call them, uh, versus the Unbox and FTR. I mean, this match again massively delivered. Again, I was I was kind of surprised, but then I, I had a chance to think about it a little while after I watched it. Um, obviously. The Blade Runner got the win. Uh, Blade Runner uh, to cash Austin uh, Austin Gun covers for the win after a hell of a twenty minutes of, of just wait, scintillating stuff for me. Jay White proved one absolute superstar he is. You can't sleep on Juice Robinson either because he makes that. He makes that team even just sometimes with his facial expression. He just makes it. The guns are learning from these guys as well. You had FTR and the Bucks. They were sort of like the new team. You could tell there's a bit of dissension still there where you had like put it, the Bang Bang Gang where they were kind of the team. And it kind of showed in this match. And maybe that's why I've done it. But Parker, this match definitely delivered for me. And I'm looking forward especially to see what happens with Jay White next. You could not ask for more out of this match. And that's uh, kind of a, a echoing sentiment throughout most of this card, just mm-hmm. because of how much these guys over delivered. I mean, I really can't put enough emphasis on this. I mean, you could tell everybody on this card was motivated. They knew they were walking behind enemy lines in Chicago. You had reports of CM Punk signs being confiscated, people mm-hmm. being told to turn their shirts inside out. I mean, everything you can think of. <laughs> so I think everybody knew what kind of environment they were potentially walking into. Bravo to Tony Khan for going out there and handling it like a boss, too, and having a one-on-one sitting in his little office chair at the top of the ramp. thought that was really cute. It was yeah. a lot better than him th- saying he was scared for his life and crying on TV, but th- I digress. With that being said, I thought that these men just absolutely killed it. I mean, this was a PWG kind of match we're talking about here. You know, Jay White obviously taking over as kind of the center stage guy for collision on the promotional material. And like we've talked about, you know, in the very limited time we've had since Punk's release, this is nothing but great news. I mean, if there's anybody who is a benefactor of Punk's release, it is Jay White, the Switchblade. And yeah, I loved. We didn't get. A, I didn't get a chance to hop on the closure review. I don't even know if we did one or not. To be honest uh, with you, we did. With, okay, cool. With that being said, 
I thought that Dax Harwood and Jay White was a great match because it seemed like the entire story beat was sell just how devastating the Blade Runner can really be and how sudden it is. And just, I mean, I think that's going to be one of the next big, probably most protected moves in professional wrestling. And you've got the guy who's the complete package, you know, kind of toting that weapon around with him. On top of that, he's got some other weapons, a.k.a. the guns. So Bullet Club Gold is looking nice and prime. And, you know, obviously you have a kind of a last-minute pairing of FTR and the Young Bucks. Yeah. And, you know, they don't really need this win. Bullet Club Gold gets a huge win on pay-per-view. I love the post-match angle of having Jay White kind of lay over the lifeless body of yeah. Cash. And, you know, Nick's kind of just like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. I'm so sorry. And you just got Jay White just pointing the gun at him. You know, kind of kind of like Orton-esque of like, you know, I can get you at any given moment. That's just how dangerous I really am. So, Jay White, you know, while MJF is poising himself to be the next big babyface in all elite wrestling, Jay White is is definitely poising himself to be the next big super villain. And I cannot wait to see how all this stuff plays out on AW programming. Side note, I thought, you know, I, I, I've just got to get this in there. I have been very critical of the Young Bucks probably for months, definitely since the brawlout situation. Yeah. And this was the most motivated I've seen them in an AEW ring in <clears> quite some time. Yeah. And that's pathetic to me. I, I, I've just got to say that. That's pathetic to me. That it took someone losing their job, you having beef with somebody, for you to go out there and finally give the fans what they want and finally give the fans a really good match and finally look like you even want to be out there. So I really don't like when anyone's fuel in life is spite or hate. I, I think that means you're doing things for the wrong reasons. I thought their little victory lap was pathetic and really petty, and it's doing nothing but fueling this drama. And, you know, I really don't think it should have taken the CM Punk stuff for them to finally go out on pay-per-view and actually look like the quote-unquote best tag team in the world. But, hey, you know, I'll play devil's advocate on this. If they feel better about coming to work now – and they can finally give us some stellar pay-per-view matchups, all the better. But this actually felt like I was watching the Young Bucks on AEW programming uh, and a nice little return to form for them. So I thought this was a, a really fun contest in general. Yeah, it was. And maybe you're right there with the whole uh, Young Bucks. They have felt as if there was something missing. I mean, even Andy picks up on it at Wembley that they felt as if something wasn't quite right. So you're pro- you're pro- you may well be right about that sentiment about it. Uh, Punk going and... Uh, the Young Bucks all of a sudden finding their mojo uh, again, which is interesting. Well, say it's interesting, but not if, you know, you know, everything has happened. People, what we've noticed. No, I definitely want to stick to what's going on in the ring. I yeah. just had to get that in there because, yeah. you know, I honestly, I FTR Bucks 3 under-delivered, in my opinion, at Wembley. And, yeah. you know, I really hate that it took a uh, weird beef with CM Punk mm. and him getting terminated for them to go out there and look like the guys that made me – watch or care about tag team wrestling again so just wanted to throw it in there and let it be known definitely so every right to this is why we have these conversations because you get your opportunity to say how what you feel about things and it's certainly certainly not the only one that feels that way uh even though that you know as we say there is a split but that is everyone's opinion and yeah, we're all entitled to it and everyone's opinion is what we like on this show anyway we certainly like to give our opinion we do have diverse opinions on some of the stuff but not on this but uh, anyway, because I feel the same about you, I don't particularly feel uh, very much before uh, of Omega and the Bucks, but we will talk about that another day. Um, main event now, my goodness me. <laughs> uh, if you wanted to see someone, we're talking about someone getting the absolute shit kicked out of them. Uh, that brings me to Orange Cassidy um, <laughs> and John Moxley in the main event. We Again, we mentioned, and I've said this a couple of times on this particular podcast, how we've said that how stars were made about them winning match. I mean, Orange Cassidy was a star anyway, but in terms of elevating him, uh, this was the match that done it. He took a, a battering. I think Dave was right. Dave all along said that there's going to come a point where all these quote unquote injuries that he's been picking up because he's had tape pretty much on every part of his body at one point during the, uh, during this run, and then it's going to come to a head and he will lose due to all these injuries. It felt like that was the way they were going with this. He did obviously put, get some offense in on Moxley, but Moxley beat the living crap out of him. Cassidy was more like an, a red apple. And maybe this this really apple. felt like a really prolonged squash match, but yeah. in the best of ways. Yes, exactly that. Um, what did you think of that? 
I, so I said earlier in this pod, and I hate to be negative here, but I'm just being honest. Mm-hmm. I, I'd have had OC go over here. I, and I say that because he has outlasted some crazy stuff during this title reign, 30-plus defenses, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I can't be with so mad about it, mainly because, you know, I mean, you have, you lose to the absolute jackhammer of AEW and John Moxley. And boy, did John Moxley beat the shit out of this guy. I mean, for me, the biggest win in this for Orange Cassidy was main eventing the pay-per-view. They had the pre-match walkout. I thought they made both. I mean, and what did you think about the main event presentation in regard? Oh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. I felt that, as I said, when we're talking about making stars and that, that just helps with Orange Cassidy as well. I, I love the present. The AEW do that good though. They do the presentations good of, of their of their of their big. I mean, most of the matches, but all of the the bigger matches, they really make a big deal out, and it gives you that big fight feel, and it gets you excited before the match even starts. <clears throat> Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I, I, it was interesting because last year was all out. Obviously, you had CM Punk taking on John Moxley yes. uh, for the undisputed AEW World Heavyweight Championship, and I thought this felt like a bigger deal than that. It just sucks that you know OC couldn't get one big last definitive. I'm a top guy now. Win, but yeah. in defeat, I think ultimately they did not do him any disservices. But I, as an OC fan during this reign wanted to see him go over here but at the same time i mentioned earlier in the pod that i felt like there were a lot of thank yous on on this pay-per-view and i feel like john moxley has been an in-ring hell out of ring mvp for aw during all this cm punk drama and i think giving him the international title opens a lot of doors and i think that it leaves an absolute psychopath to get through if you want to be AEW international champion and Dare I say, we might not be done with the Orange Cassidy versus John Moxley saga, but hell of a first entry, and I hope that this isn't our last time seeing him in the main event of a pay-per-view. I think he's come eons yeah. since he had that triple threat against Omega and Pac, and uh, I think, that, what was it, double or nothing a couple of years ago? Yeah, so it was, yeah. awesome. it was awesome to see the natural progression of Orange Cassidy, but the win but i i think there's a bigger story they're telling here and i've got a feeling that itch will be scratched down the line yeah i think maybe orange Cassidy might get a, a, a few quite well-deserved weeks off a couple of weeks off now perhaps because they looked like there was kind of them he was you know the crowd was saying thank you orange and all that and he was getting a bit emotional in the ring maybe it's maybe it's a couple of weeks off before he gets back on the saddle so to speak and, and looks at moxley but interesting point Moxley does travel. He's he's over here quite a bit. So I wonder now whether he'll be defending the international title when he comes over to like the UK and Ireland and other places just to give it a bit more prestige. Because AEW, they, they do that very well with these promotions. They work with promotions. And he does defend. You see them. You do see those titles defended over here and, and, and internationally. So perhaps him being international champion means we're going to get a few defenses in some promotions in other countries. Yeah, and Moxley looks like a man possessed right now. The shit yeah. he did during Stadium Stampede made him look like a, a little serial killer in the ring. So I'm excited to see the matches and the matchups we get out of this. But the international aspect, no pun intended, is actually a really good point. Yeah, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to Dynamite. I love when pay-per-views is finished and you can't wait to watch the next show. That's what it's all about. Parker, we are done for the all-out review. I thank you for doing this while you're driving away we're not actually driving but while you're out and about doing your stuff we will be back to talk some more AEW probably at some point this week we've got some dynamite to be watching uh and obviously our good leader Andy's popping in to see you from England to say hello on Friday so perhaps we can get a we can organize a collision review with Andy in the states with you yeah, we'll see what we can do. Uh, I, I got to give him some receipts about all this punk stuff, though. Don't think <laughs> I forgot, Andy. Don't think I forgot. No, in, in, all, serious, in all seriousness, it's going to be a blast. Uh, I'm excited to see Andy. Yeah, I, I think he's excited to see you as well, my friend. But Parker, thank you so much for coming on board. Guys, this was the Hit in the Turnbuckle podcast. This was the All Out Review Show. He's been Parker Hamlet, or Agent Parker, as, we, as I call him now. I've been your host, Adam Cousins. Until next time, everybody. Buckle down, stay safe, and goodbye. 